The best understanding of America begins, or so it seems to us, with the realization that this nation is young yet, that she is still new and unfinished, that even now America is man's greatest adventure in time and space. The University of North Carolina presents American Adventure, a study of man in the new world, his values and his characteristics, who he is, what he believes, what he lives by. American Adventure is produced on a grant and aid from the National Association of Educational Broadcasters, made possible by the Educational Television and Radio Center. Written by John Ely, directed by John Clayton, Today's program presents John Ely as Eddie in Story of a Poet. Eddie loved me, and he loved Virginia, and he was kind to us. I hear he was not kind to everyone, and I know he was not easy to understand. From the first time I knew him, that was in Baltimore, when he was a young man, and he was hungry, and he was without funds. From that moment, I saw in him a certain need for understanding. I can soar, Aunt Clem. I can soar with God. Eddie, don't be sacrilegious. No, I mean it. I am not as other men. I see too clearly what lies beyond our vanity and our pomp. I am a poet. You and your poems, boy. You had best get a job. So my foster father in Richmond says. Get a job, learn the business, go to West Point... No, I don't care for that. There's much to be said for money, Eddie. And he has said it all. And he has money. He is rich. I grew up rich. But I am not as others are. No, you are impossible. That's what you are. Yes, exactly. Because I can soar higher, higher. I can see realms they can never even touch. Oh, you frighten me. Do I? From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone. And all I loved, I loved alone. Eddie, what is all that? You're a serious, boy. You see, Aunt Lim, I can soar. You're serious. Shall I tell you what it is like up there? Up where, Eddie? It is like, like beauty without eyes. It is like music without a tone. It is the heart of music that lies beyond the sound. It is like clear water and a stone. It is like God must be on pleasant days, except there is no throne, no ornaments, no diadem, but only God alone. And I am also alone. Do you remember my mother, Aunt Clem? Yes. She was an actress. I have heard stories about her. Oh, don't believe all that. I don't remember her except the night she died, lying high on the pillows, coughing her life away. Eddie, please. Will you be my mother, Aunt Clem? Oh, now. Now, now. And my father I never saw, and so I am left with my foster father who speaks of wealth, who talks of business, who breeds money like a rooster in a chicken coop. Eddie. He doesn't understand that I am different as you do. Be my mother, Aunt Clem. Well, of course, Eddie. Of course. But I must warn you, Mother. I am not as others are. And I have never been. Now, I'm sure you know why it is that after a year, West Point must mark your name from its rolls. I am not a soldier, sir. I'll vouch for that. Though when you first came here, your grades were high. My mind is as good as another's. Better than others. But now, why? Only that I began to know I could not put my life into this tiny path. Sir? There is much that is greater than a soldier. Oh. For me, there is far more. For I can walk with God. Would you close that door? Someone might overhear your foolishness. But it is true. It is absurd. But, sir, I do not mean the God that, that is up there. And yet I do. I mean, at any rate, that I know him, some mighty power, and I can walk with beauty. 
So I came to see that I should not be here. No doubt. For I am not a soldier, but am more. You are not a soldier. That is true. And now your destination? My destiny, sir. It will be found in New York. For there will be men who will recognize my genius. Indeed. Then good luck to you. We cannot use you at West Point. I do not know what you may be, but you are not a soldier. Eddie married Virginia, my daughter, when she was hardly more than a child. And the three of us lived together in New York. New York could not ignore Eddie. No one ever could. But New York could not accept him on his terms. Oh, they are filled with high praise. But they pay me nothing except a cent or two a line. They print my work and tell me I am good, even too good, whatever that may mean. Eddie, do not be bitter. But how can I live? They print my stories and my poems, distribute them to the world. But then they say that people cannot understand my work, that I am beyond. Then come to where the people are. No, that I will not do. I soar as high as I can, Aunt Clem. Yes, dear. But even a poet must live in a world, must stay warm in winter, eat food. Then let us eat my stories and my poetry. Oh, what a meal that would be. What a banquet. What a critical bit of indigestion awaits us there. Eddie, please. No, Aunt Clem. I think I know the reason they do not praise my work. But some do, Eddie. Others do not. It is simply this. They cannot soar as high as I. And so they are jealous. That's the clear and simple reason why. Eddie, perhaps it is. But forget all that. You know, and... following after Cooper and Hawthorne and the like, those who are not nearly so gifted. Eddie, please be quiet. You might awaken Virginia and she's ill. Not one-tenth so good. I tell you, Aunt Clem, I can turn a story on a mood and build a plot into a screaming dynasty. I can write a verse that sings, that dances on the English tongue. Eddie, dearest Eddie, little boy, small child. Son, don't fret, don't worry. Someday you'll show them, show them all. Now, what is this you've written here? Oh, that, it's a little thing, a poem. Well, what do the editors say of it? I haven't shown it to them. May I read it? Yes, of course. To... to Dash. What does Dash mean? Well, the, the poem is to a woman, any woman, anyone beautiful. To Virginia. If you like. I heed not that my earthly lot hath little of earth in it. What does that mean, Eddie, little of earth? little of those things that the earth gives those who serve its materialistic purposes. That years of love have been forgot in the hatred of a minute. Oh, very pretty, Eddie. I mourn not that the desolate are happier sweet than I. Desolate? Earthbound creatures are desolate, though they are happier than those of us who try to soar aloft. I mourn not that the desolate are happier sweet than I, but that you sorrow for my fate, who am a passerby. It's short, Eddie. Yes, and it will be measured by the inch. Let me have it. Oh, no, Eddie, don't crumple it, please. Don't throw it in the fire. Here, let me get it out. Yes, get it out. Save it for some future year, for it is to be measured by the inch. It is to be paid for by the line, and it is worth a quarter of a dollar. Save it. It is worth a quarter of a dollar. So I hope, sir, that my stories, of which I have many, might be gathered into a book which you would publish. I read some of your stories. Very unrealistic. Well, yes, and I think there would be a market for such a book. Do you? Perhaps so. Last year, as associate editor of a magazine, I published stories and criticisms, and the circulation of the magazine increased eightfold. Indeed. Uh, why did you leave it, then? Oh, there was a reason or two that seemed acceptable at the time. They paid me too little, and I didn't realize that without them I would be paid nothing at all. Well, sir, I will look over your stories. They are... Serious and morbid, those I've read. Reflections of what my other world is becoming. Uh, how's that? I hope you will publish them. Uh, what payment would be acceptable to you? What is your policy? Oh, I could readily give you, say, 
20 books as payment for the work. Why, sir, need I remind you that without my long and anxious hours, there would be no stories and could be no book? 20 copies, sir, I cannot eat them. Oh, you look at this from the writer's point of view. But you've been an editor. Surely you know your stories will not circulate so many books that I can hope for profit after my high cost. It would be worth something to have my stories in a book. Give me my 20 copies. Perhaps they will keep me warm for a day or two. My son-in-law is known throughout the world. His poems and stories are published everywhere. And yet, in his life, he received less than $225 for all his books. In all his life of defeat. Oh, but there was one moment of victory... One poem, but even that the editors would not publish until he demanded it. I do not ask if you want it, sir. I tell you that this poem is better than my best. You cannot expect me to walk the streets time and again trying to sell my best poem and go home night after night to tell my wife and my mother-in-law that I have no money. I have in my hands my greatest work, but there is no one in this city or in Philadelphia who will publish it. And I have read your poem, and I do not care for it. It makes no sense to me. You and your arty ways, up in the clouds, you must come down to earth, sir. I am not printing a magazine for seers, but one for readers. Will you give me twenty dollars for the poem? I won't give you anything for it, sir. Uh, sir, you will if I must wring it from your neck. Ten dollars? One dollar... One cent but something, something I demand. And who are you to demand? I am the creator of this piece of work, and you an editor. I do not care for the work, sir. Sir, my mother-in-law sews very well. And she sews, and by that means she and my wife and I live. I, I will not tell you what our life is like. I only know that from the time I was a boy, I have felt a power which I do not believe all men have. Nonsense. Please go. And I have in my hands, sir, see, see how they shake. My hands shake as if they had just plowed a field that was too large for my strength. I, I have in these hands a poem which, by the grace of God, I've written. A poem, sir. And you are an editor. Please go. Please now, sir. Please go. And I do not know why you do not like it. Listen to it, sir. No, I have looked it over, and it is too long to listen to. A, a part of it. Here, I'll omit this. I'll omit this. The first part is, is only about a man who, who was thinking about his lost love, Lenore... And he heard a knock, and he answered the door, and no one was there. And Go on, then. Go on, read the poem. But only if you will leave when it is done. Yes, yes, of course. Let's see. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and the echo murmured back the word... Lenore, merely this and, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is in this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment in this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter. When with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he. But with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon the bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. In this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling. I suppose I should stop. I see you aren't listening. Yes, sir, I don't like your poem. But it has a rhythm. Strange one, to be sure. Unusual. But it has some interest. And I will publish it. Should I thank you, sir? No, I will not. And how much do you want for it? Only its value to you. Its value to me is beyond price. Ten dollars? Very well, sir. Thank you for dropping by. Sir, may I have the money now? I, I wouldn't ask except... I understand. Tell the girl in the outer office to give you $10 for this 
this raven. The Raven was published and was instantly successful, beyond the success of any other poem ever printed in this country, perhaps anywhere. And Eddie was called a great poet. The Raven did for him what the gold bug and his stories had not done so well. He was successful. But instead of changing him for the better, it made more evident than ever the evil tide that defeat had left with him. Now, at last, I have shown them. Mr. Poe, would you lecture here? Mr. Poe, would you write this? Would you criticize this? Could we reprint this? Have you something for our publication? Now, Virginia, they know. Wonderful, lady. Wonderful, darling. And now they will find out, Virginia. Find out what? I will lecture, certainly. And they will come. All the writers and editors and critics will come. And I will stand before them. I, the raven. They call me that now. Yes, Eddie. I will stand there on the lighted stage. And like a burst from God himself, I'll set the record straight and tell them only their own incompetence and inadequacy have held back from this nation its literary growth. I will tell them that they have killed time and again the spark of art that might otherwise rise to bless us and to burst our nation's Eddie, name aflame. Eddie, no. No, don't say that to them. Not now. It must be said, Virginia, and I will say it. Oh, it will be clear enough. And when I am done, they will have heard the truth about themselves. Uh, come in. Sit down. Now, what can I do for you? You are the editor? Yes. My name is Mrs. Clem. I'm happy to meet you. I have here some poems I thought might be of interest. I can't recall a poet named Clem. The poems are not mine, sir. They belong to my son-in-law. You've heard of him. What's his name? Read the poems, sir. Please read them and I will tell you. I see. No, I will tell you his name. Edgar Allan Poe. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Mrs. Clem, you are an old lady. I do not want to hurt you. Then, sir, please read the poems. Very well. How is Mr. Poe? His health, I mean. He's not very well. His wife is ill, I understand. Consumption, sir. Oh, too bad. I'm sorry. Poe could have been a tremendous success... If he had only had a bit of humility, a sense of fairness, if would, he would have tried to understand the, the other man's point of view or the other man's work. And, of course, if he had left the bottle alone. Yes, sir. He drinks too much. And it worries me. And I should imagine. Only one glass of wine and he's instantly changed. One glass? Even a small glass. He becomes someone else. And when he takes a drink, we don't see him for days sometimes. Mm, I've heard of men like that. At any rate, his work has fallen off, Mrs. Clem. I will buy a poem or two because you need help, I know. Last week I sold some of his poems, but... To whom? Oh, not to an editor. You won't believe me, sir. And Eddie must never know. But occasionally I sell his work as waste paper. It brings something that way. The poetry of Edgar Allan Poe. Waste paper. What a shame it had to come to that. And who's to blame? Yes. Yes, I will help you. We must all try to take care of him. Virginia, child, you must go to bed. I will, Eddie. <coughs> You were ill. I know. I have been ill all my life. I know illness well. But I thought I could copy a poem for you. I have written nothing today. Last night, it, it was the same. Last night? Last month, last year? Child, I try to soar again. I go up to the poet's stratosphere, and there I beat my wings like some old eagle. But to no avail, Virginia... There is no beauty there now, only darkness, darkness and bitterness. Eddie, do you love me? 
Virginia, you know I love you. Will you write a poem for me? Child, don't ask me to do what I cannot do. Eddie, do you love me? Oh, Virginia. Write a poem for me. I cannot. Perhaps, Eddie, it, it is because you hate too much. But you love me. And maybe poetry can best be written only in sympathy. So wise you are to be a child. A sick, small child. Oh, you are a child, too. We are children, you and I, playing games. Yes. You were a child and I am a child in our rented home. Oh, no. In our kingdom. In our kingdom by the sea. Oh. And we love with a love that is more than love. I and my... My... Lee? Annabel Lee, I will call you that in our poem. Yes, darling. We love with a love that is more than love. I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher. Go on, Eddie. No. No, I cannot go on. It is beautiful. But it is tragic. Whatever I touch must turn to death. No, it, it is beautiful. Death can be beautiful, Eddie. I know I will die soon. Please, dear. I know that. But it can be beautiful, Eddie. Go on, dear. Virginia, let me be. No, I cannot do that. All your life you've criticized others because they were not as you. And yet, the fact that you are not as they, that's the secret, Eddie. That's the beautiful thing. I would not love you nearly so much if, if you were just as they. But I must work with them. And even worse, I must become like them in order to survive. All my life, you must go into business. You must go to West Point. You Eddie, must... darling, forget all that. You are not as they, Eddie. And they cannot be blamed for... Being unlike you. But in a nation as great as this, isn't it a pity that I must go hungry and my wife must accept food from neighbors? And you need medical Eddie, attention. The, the world is full of badness, even for the wealthy. Let's think of what is beautiful. Eddie, promise me. Yes, dear. But what will I do when you are not here to tell me what is beautiful? Oh, now, now... Come, let's write down our poem. I will write and you dictate. And tomorrow Mother can take it to town for us. Go on, darling. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She was a child and I was a child in this kingdom by the sea. And we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. Recite me a poem, Eddie. Huh? Hey, waiter, another bottle over here. Go ahead, Eddie. I must go home. Ah, oh, you have no home. Your wife is dead. My aunt is there, Aunt Clem. My mother. My mother and my aunt. Ah, you make no sense to me. Recite me a poem. Go ask a poet for a poem. Look at me. Where did I get the mud in my clothes? Where have I been? <laughs> drunk. 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 Where else could you go? 
Tell me a story, Paul. I don't know any stories. Don't 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 know any? <laughs> why why the gold bug will do? Or the purloined letter? Or what's the matter with the black cat? The fall of the house of Usher. The murders in the room war. You see? I know your work. You've written half a hundred. Now tell me one of them. I will tell you one. Once upon a time in a country not far from here, there was a boy who walked with God. Huh? And everyone laughed at him, except his mother and his wife. His countrymen would not admit he walked with God. And they left him to beg his food. So he learned to hate the world he lived in. And when he learned to hate, he could not walk with God. That's a story? Hey, waiter, that bottle. In heaven a spirit does dwell whose heart strings are a lute. How's that? None sings so wildly well as the angel Israfel. And uh, Just a minute, Eddie. Wait a minute. Quiet, everybody. Now, everybody listen. Mr. Edgar Allan Poe, the noted author of Richmond, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, has consented to recite one of his original poems. A poem about heaven. Stand up, Betty. Of course. In heaven a spirit doth dwell whose heart strings are a lute. None sings so wildly well as the angel Israfel. And the giddy stars, so legends tell, ceasing their hymns, attend the spell of his voice all mute. And they say, the starry choir and the other listening things, that Israfel's fire is owing to that lyre by which he sits and sings the trembling living wire of those unusual strings. Yes, Israfel, heaven is thine. But this is a world of sweets and sours. Our flowers are merely flowers. And the shadow of thy perfect bliss is the sunshine of ours. If I could dwell where Israfel hath dwelt, and he were I, he might not sing so wildly well a mortal melody. While a bolder note than this might swell from my lyre within the sky. Beautiful, lady. Beautiful. Here, have a drink. I was his aunt and his mother. And you must not judge him simply by what I say. Oh, I know he had faults, and he was not always kind. But nonetheless, what a pity. What a terrible poor thing. And who's to blame? American Adventure is written by John Ely directed by John Clayton, and is produced by the Communication Center of the University of North Carolina, Earl Wynn, director. Monitor takes you everywhere each weekend on NBC Radio.